Coming up next on Passion Struck. The evolution gap is a gap that I'm suggesting exists between our incessantly slow pace of biological evolution and our unbelievable capacity and accelerated capacity for innovation. And the idea is that we started changing the environment faster than our genetics could keep up with, and that opened the gap. And I would suggest to you that almost all the pain and suffering, emotional, physical, even social, that we're suffering exists in that gap or is at least amplified by that gap. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles, and on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am so honored to welcome Eric Edmeads back on Passion Struck. Welcome, Eric. It's so good to see you again. Hey, good to be back. Great to see you. In our last conversation, which for the reference for listeners is episode 433, we discussed the essential keys to post-diabetic transformation, and you introduced a groundbreaking concept from your book, this idea of being post-diabetic. Can you talk about the impact of the book since its release and what's changed from awareness about this post-diabetic concept? It's been an interesting process. We've had some really great victories. We've had some difficulties. Without getting into specifics, I'll just say that some of the social media platforms that we normally run advertising and book campaigns are not as happy about the message that uh, diabetes is reversible. And we've really run into quite a few roadblocks in that area, to be honest, that's been fascinating. But in terms of the impact, I've really been warmed by the stories that we've begun to collect, both from, let's say, people directly impacted by diabetes and the stories they've shared with us about recovery and moving into that post-diabetic world, but also the stories and commentary that we've had from the people that are indirectly impacted. That would be particularly in this case, the medical workers. And it's really been interesting to have doctors come back and say, why don't they teach us this? And I'm so glad that I know this now. Like it isn't while drugs can be helpful, while they can be supportive for certain symptoms and what have you, the fact is that you can, you, you know, that the type 2 diabetes is largely for the vast majority of people optional. And I, I, many of the people that we've interacted with since the book came out have really been shocked really to hear that message. And many others have said, I felt so alone because I, because they had that same opinion and that same knowledge. And I suppose the book gave them some, uh, a sense of support, a sense that there is a, a movement going on. Well, I just want to ask a follow-on question to that because um, our mutual friend, Dr. Mark Hyman, has been on this train for a long time, as has Dr. Gabrielle Lyon and a few others who are talking about the need that the curriculum in medical school needs to change to put more emphasis on diet. Are you seeing anything from your perspective that's actually happening? No. I mean... (laughs) First of all, Mark's a great example of what we were talking about. The title of the book, Host Diabetic, came about because we started referring to our reversed clients as post-diabetic. And in a conversation with Mark one day, I mentioned that to him and the look on his face told me that we were onto something. And he asked me for clarity about what exactly I meant. And I explained the idea that you and I talked about last time that that post-diabetic is a very useful reframing of the diagnosis because somebody who's pre-diabetic but trending in the other direction should probably be getting different medical advice. And somebody who's fully in remission should be cognizant of the fact that they have a predisposition. And so they remain in that post-diabetic stage. And it was Mark's recognition of that logic that really inspired me to want to get that book out. And that's why I was so very honored that he did the Ford for us. Now, in terms of actual impact, I will say this as carefully as I can. I definitely have seen an impact at the street level. What I mean is that there are many doctors now that have really made a commitment towards supporting people in becoming post-diabetic and not necessarily being reliant on a purely pharmaceutical solution to make that happen. And I've seen lots of that. And that's, I think that's just going to continue to happen. And it's really amazing. I will say with no out comment on any political leanings one way or the other, uh, one of the things that I have admired about RFK's approach to this, to his PR campaign has been going straight at this health issue. 
Now, whatever anybody else believes about the politics, that should be a topic that everybody agrees on and that, that we've got a problem in that area. And so I, I do see that there are changes that are happening, that we're part of that change and that we're stimulating some of that change in our small way. I would say that on a larger level, it's going to take, it's a big ship. It's going to take a long time. I will say that there's a country that we've been working with and I won't name the country outright, but there's a country that we've been working with because a member of the government went through our program and got really excellent results. And we engaged with the primary healthcare provider. We got quite in deep into conversations about helping that country that has, and it has a significant problem in this area. And then all of a sudden the talks just stopped, not nothing fell apart. It was just like, oh, um, that's no longer a priority for us. And that, that it's, it's difficult because if you imagine in many countries, the healthcare system, frankly, is funded by disease. So you have this weird chicken and egg problem that if you actually solve the disease, you're actually you're having a negative impact on revenue. And that's a problem. Another country, a prominent country, has taken a different approach. Uh, I've met with a number of government officials. We, we are now in direct conversations about integrating programs into their healthcare system in a trial basis. They're being very proactive about it. In the United States, we're not, we haven't gotten anywhere from a governmental level, but, but we have certainly made inroads in the insurance area where insurance companies are beginning to see the long tail benefit of reversing the condition so that the payouts are going to be reduced in the future. So we're seeing change. We're part of the change. We're stimulating it where we can. You would think the insurance companies would want and welcome the change because for them, it means less out of pocket having to pay people to take the drugs and everything else when you could it, just it, focus. It's really challenging. And governments are always, in a sense, trying to protect the people. I, I would argue sometimes too much, but that's a different political conversation. Uh, but I would say that let's imagine you have a country and the country has a um, healthcare challenge, like most countries do, and they have a lot of privatized insurance. Now what you want to do is make sure that the insurance companies are policed, that they're not uh, price gouging, that they're not boosting their profitability in, in unethical ways. So you create legislation to protect them. And in a misguided way, what if you decide to create legislation that forces them to tie their profitability to, the, to their payouts? So the, in other words, the only way for them to increase profitability ends up being to increase their payouts. So if you were to then come along and introduce a magic pill that just fixed diabetes overnight for everybody, their payouts would suddenly drop dramatically. And therefore, so would they have to govern their profitability down by reducing premiums and what have you. Now, this is a mechanism that the government did to try to protect the consumers. In other words, if payouts went down, premiums should come down. Fair principle, fair idea. But when you tie it directly to profitability like that, now you have a company that says, well, actually, our profitability is expanded by having additional payouts. Now, I'm not saying there's any particular country anywhere in the world with a major healthcare problem that has a system like this in a legislation, but imagine if they did, it would be difficult. It would, but I think that's why uh, initiatives like Sir Richard Branson's B team an initiative, I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not, where he's getting the CEOs to sign up to try to make the valuations of their companies based on something different than shareholder value and profits, et cetera, I yeah, think it's is so paramount. Stuff. I mean, if you could make the payout and the valuation based on health outcomes and making them better for people, what a change that would be. I, I agree. I, I'm funny enough. I'll be with Richard in about four days and I was with him a couple of, I guess about three months ago. And we had a lot of talks about, because that was just before my book came out and before our book came out. And so I'm very happy to go take him a copy now and, and continue the conversation. And I know that he was actually quite involved in a project in the BVI around dealing with diabetes in that area. And this conversation about that like, revaluation of the company, it's tough because of course, companies are valued by market forces. So how do you influence the market forces? Well, one of the ways you do that is by changing people's value systems. And so when you start seeing, say, ethical funds coming along, that is, in my opinion, part of exactly what Richard's aiming for there. If you and I preferentially go to our, our investment advisor and say, I want to be in a, a mutual fund, I want to be in an index fund or what have you, but the company has to maintain this score on, on the social good delivery campaign that they do, then you are changing the company valuation based on that other version of profitability. And I think that's a, a good move. Well, awesome. I hope he runs with it because he's got the power along with you to influence change. 
Now, I I'd say to, significantly yeah. more power, but I appreciate that. <laughs> Here, here also plugged in Tony Robbins and a whole bunch of other people can, can help get on the bandwagon here. I'm largely on this bandwagon because of Tony Robbins and he has been a significant force. He was the first one that kind of got me questioning aspects of pharmaceuticals. And listen, I get, they save our lives and the world is definitely in many ways better because of pharmaceutical companies. I also know that, <laughs> that can be true at the same time that they could take advantage of things at times. And so he has really been a force for transformation in my own life. And I know in the lives of many other people that are out fighting this battle as well. Yeah. Well, I'll just bring two things up for the listeners. If they don't know it about Tony one, he's been living with a, a, a brain mass for many years, which many people wanted him to operate. He decided he, he didn't want to do that because of the potential impacts it could have on his life and the way he wanted to lead it. So he made modifications to help him deal with that. And the other thing is he is one of the best sources I've heard of using stem cells to correct injuries instead of going through surgical procedures. So those are two real huge value points that the audience can check out if you want to. He's had a really interesting journey with, with that stuff. He grew 11 inches in a single year in high school because of that tumor of stimulating growth hormone and what have you. He makes a joke, of course, I wouldn't want to surgically remove it. I get like $200 worth of free HGH every week. But I will say that, and when I first encountered him in my like late teens, early 20s, I remember him telling this story and it was very familiar to me and I've seen it a lot now, but he said, he had spent a huge part of his life feeling really paranoid that some disease was just going to strike him down one day. And of course, with the media being the way it is, we are constantly being told one in three people from cancer, 50%, if you get to 75 years, 50% chance of Alzheimer's, a pandemic is coming. Like, it's no wonder that people are really afraid. But what he chose to do was a slightly different response. And it simulated a lot of my decision making. And that was to say, look, these things are out there. But first of all, a huge number of them are self-created. Now, I don't like the term lifestyle disease. I think that is a term designed to shift the blame onto the consumer for unconscionable products and marketing programs and so on. But at the end of the day, there's a degree of truth to it that a lot of those diseases are actually avoidable by lifestyle. And then the other issue is that what about the diseases that aren't necessarily avoidable life by lifestyle, say a pathogen or a virus? Well, mm -hmm. as we saw during the pandemic, your lifestyle had a huge impact on your outcome in that situation, your body's ability to protect itself. And so I, I was stimulated by his story of being terrified about all these diseases and realized, yeah, we should be terrified about them, but not cowering in the corner and, and living in a germ protective dome. It should be taking the best care of our bodies that we can so that we're in the best position to deal with those things if they approach. Well, I think that's a great lead in, Eric, to the rest of our discussion today. And I want to take you back in time. There was a major pivot in your own health that happened in 1991, if I have the year correct that changed your life forever and gave you extraordinary amounts of energy. What was that pivot? Well, like most pivots, it started with rock bottom, right? It started with being sick. And so at some point in my mid teens, I started developing horrible acne. I had debilitating allergies. I couldn't breathe through my own sinus passages. I had throat infections so severe that my, if you looked into my throat, you would see these two golf ball sized tonsils bleeding every day. I had digestive problems that made it very difficult for me to even think when the cramps hit in. And generally that was my life. And I, I don't know if I can explain this really well, but the bottom line is that children faced with chronic pain, learn pain management techniques so that they don't, they just start to live with the pain. And that's basically what happened. I just basically, that, that was me. It was my life. I didn't, sure, my parents sent me off to doctors and specialists and recommended everything that they could to manage those symptoms, but nothing helped. And in 1991, a buddy of mine convinced me for my business that I should go, as we talked about earlier, to a Tony Robbins seminar, a, a business communication seminar. And I went there thinking I was going to learn how to make more money and learn how to communicate better with people. And of course, I did learn those things. But what I really learned was on the final day, Tony started talking about food. And I thought, what? why is the dude with the teeth talking about the food? Like, we're not, that's not what we're here for. But he started saying some things that made some sense. And in the end, what happened for me was that I was so inspired by that little bonus content that I then started doing a bit of my own research and looking into this whole food thing. Of course, I was very lucky because I had a great grandfather that was a, 
archaeologists, zoologists who discovered the oldest homo sapiens skulls. So I had a little benefit of that science in my life. And I undertook a 30 day experiment inspired by Tony. And it was, I'm going to cut out a few of these things. I'm going to add in a few of these things. And 30 days later, I was 35 pounds down. I was, all of my symptoms were gone. I looked completely different and my quality of life was upgraded by far more than one order of magnitude. What an incredible story. And I also think a good part of your story that we should recap, just in case the audience isn't aware of it, is you've spent significant time with Bushmen in East Africa. We discussed this on the last episode, but I think it's important for you to unpack that a little bit so you can tell the listeners would it help you understand about how our ancestors lived in harmony with nature? It's a bit of a tough topic if we can't dive into it really properly. And I'll tell you why, because the advent of the paleo movement and ancestral diets and that kind of stuff has uh, stimulated a lot of conversation. And then you've got these naysayers that immediately come on and go, well, just because they lived that way doesn't mean we should live that way. They couldn't fly and now we can fly. And so they want to try and deframe that argument pretty heavily. One of the most common approaches to that is to, is to tr- question their lifespans. Well, their average lifespan wasn't very long, but of course, this is a very interesting trick of statistics because you see their average lifespan say might be 30 years old, but they also have 80% infant mortality. So a very low level spreadsheet can show you that if you lose 80% of your children before the age of five to get to an average age of 30, the people who make it through the gauntlet of childhood are actually living quite a long time. And so I want to preface that the argument that we should be looking at our ancestral history seems to be contentious. And what I want to suggest is that it's absolutely straightforward. And I'm going to put it this way. If you had an exotic pet, uh, you just inherited this exotic pet and you didn't know how to take care of it, you have two choices. You can go and read all the articles at Harvard Research or PubMed that were probably sponsored by pet food companies, or you could watch the Nature Channel or Discovery or Nat Geo and watch a two-hour special on that animal, and you will know more about the care and maintenance and, and support of that animal from that two hours than any sponsored research paper was ever going to show you. And based on that logic, what I would suggest is that there are definitely clues about our evolved lifestyle and our evolved biology, uh, there are definitely clues to that lie in archaeological history and to some degree in our modern day contemporary hunter-gatherer people. And so what happened in my case was I used to run these leadership programs. I would take people up Kilimanjaro because I wanted them to have something real to wrestle with while they dealt with managing your emotions and leadership and so on and came down the mountain one day and my logistics partner said, hey, would you like to go and meet some Bushmen? Well, you have to understand, I, I've been fantasizing in my head about what life must have looked like in a hunter-gatherer way because my grandfather found the oldest Homo sapien skull in history at that time. And so I'd held a model, a cast of that skull in my hand at 12 years old. And I had daydreamed incessantly about what that life might have looked like. And all of a sudden, somebody was inviting me to go and look to the closest representation of that life that exists on Earth today. And I went 15 years ago. And I have to tell you, it was mind blowing. It was absolutely transformational for me to see people living in an environment that was a direct match to their evolution of biology. And most importantly, to their evolved emotional responses or their evolved production of neurotransmitters, they were living exactly in the place where those things evolved. And they had a level of emotional harmony that I have not witnessed really anywhere else with any kind of consistency. And of course, I could go on. I mean, the nutritional ideas that we discovered there, the family dynamics, relationship dynamics, parenting dynamics, so much can be learned. And again, I am not romanticizing the life of the Hadzabe people or the Khoisan Bushmen or any of those people as a perfect representation of our history. But what I'm suggesting is that it really is the closest representation of our history that we have on earth today, aside maybe from the archaeological record. Well, Eric, one thing that your last episode did is it stirred a lot of questions about the ancestral diet uh, from the audience, and they asked me to bring on other experts so that they could learn more. So since your episode, I've had on Dr. Michael Greger, Dr. Terry Walls, Cynthia Thurman, uh, Morley Robbins, Dr. Chris Kenobi, just to to name a few where for me, it's been enlightening because I've read all their books, but I think we've brought a lot more to bear on experts who, like yourself, have been studying this and seeing how the positive implications can help everything from, in Terry's case, reversing pretty much MS 
or at least holding it stable and getting yeah. her out of a wheelchair to, to other things. I think there are bigger clues than we realize. In fact, you and I were talking about my, on our last uh, discussion, the post-diabetic book, this book here, which is not out, but the evolution gap, that's a galley copy. In fact, there is a pre-release version on Kindle that you can sneak over and get. It's a, but the book hasn't actually been officially released. But that book explores something that we call the evolution gap. And the evolution gap is a gap that I'm suggesting exists between our incessantly slow pace of biological evolution and our unbelievable capacity and accelerated capacity for innovation. And the idea is that as we started to change our environment, we started changing the environment faster than our genetics could keep up with. And that opened the gap. And I would suggest to you that almost all the pain and suffering, emotional, physical, even social that we're suffering exists in that gap or is at least amplified by that gap. And so studying our evolutionary biology and studying our ancestral history and studying contemporary modern, contemporary hunter gatherers, and even studying chimpanzees and bonobos, all of those things can give us some fascinating insights into the human condition and help us discover solutions to many of the problems that we're dealing with today. So I want to explore, I, I know you can't at this point talk too much about this book because you're, it, it's not out yet, but I do want to talk about something that I've heard you discuss in the past, and that's something that you describe as the perfect human diet. And how do modern diets deviate from what our bodies are actually designed to consume if we were to have that perfect human diet? Okay, I think we need to start with the word diet. Uh, diet in every context in science, in nature, diet means way of life for that particular species. It's only us and our pets that can go on a diet, which is this newly adopted version of the word, which means something akin to a temporary alteration to my normal lifestyle in order to achieve a particular health goal on a particular day. When we talk about the idea of the perfect human diet, we go back to the same thing that I mentioned earlier. And that is that if we want to learn about a, an exotic animal and we want to understand its diet, the best way to do that is to observe it in its natural environment when it's following its natural instincts. So, so then the question is, well, how do you veer from that? Well, a really good example would be elephants. In the 1800s, they, they were capturing elephants and taking them for zoos and circuses and all that kind of stuff. And effective that was that those elephants, rather than living 70 years like they would normally live in nature, were now living only seven, eight, nine, 10 years. And, um, and of course, an examination of that demonstrated the cause, what was going on. And that was that they'd been so shockingly removed from their natural environment that they were nutritionally under stress, they were mentally under stress, they, they weren't getting the movement that they needed in every way, they, they were not living according to their design. And of course that resulted in them dying 60 years earlier they really needed to do. Now that's a harsh change, right? It was like, you take an elephant from the wild and you put it in nature. Clearly there's no adaptation that's gonna help it with that. So then we look at our situation and it's not quite as harsh. Although we have examples of that harshness in our history. When Banting was traveling around Canada on behalf of the Hudson's Bay Company in the early days of Canada, he was traveling around Northern Canada and, and investigating what was going on with the original Canadian people, the, the original settlers, the first the, before Europeans arrived. And he, on the way, on the, at the end of that tour, he was on a train and he was talking to a guy just casually about what he observed out there. And, and he said what he observed is, first of all, unfair transactions, buying huge tracts of land when they didn't even understand the concept of land ownership for, the, for, the, for, for a bag of beads and flour. But he said even more devastating than that is that they were not able to handle European foods they were being given. And it was causing widespread disease all over the place. And boy, did he get in trouble for saying this to this guy because it turned out the guy was a reporter. And so the guy reported his words and Banting was under an NDA from both the government and the Hudson's Bay Company. So he wasn't allowed to say that stuff. And they asked him to, apparently they asked him to issue a retraction. And he says, look, I know I wasn't supposed to say it, but I'm not now going to suggest that I was lying. It's another example of, of, of too harsh a change. But then let's talk about the gradual change, which is in some ways even more dangerous. And that is, imagine you and I are in the bush 50,000 years ago, or actually probably 20,000 years ago, and we return to one of, our, one of our koi camps, a place that we go to on a regular basis. And we suddenly notice, hold on a second now, wait a second. Those bushes that we like the berries from, they're growing in camp now. How did they get here? How did that happen? Wait. 
isn't that where we usually sit on the rock and throw the seeds behind us and spit them out and what have you? You don't suppose, you don't suppose we did that. You don't suppose we did that. Is that, did we do that? And all of a sudden agriculture is born. And the minute agriculture is born, there's a bunch of decisions to make. Shall we grow these yummy sweet things or these sour bitter things that we only ever eat because we're starving? Well, we're going to grow more of the sweet things. And then as we learn more about that, we learn that we can crossbreed things and we can improve their sugar intake. And gradually, gradually we veer away from our diet. And I don't just mean food. I mean how much we have to walk the air that we're breathing, the quality of the water that we're breathing, the amount of water, the timing of the food that we eat, both in terms of the daily timing, say in the concept of say an intermittent fasting conversation or the seasonal timing relative to metabolic reset. All of that stuff starts to get messed with, but really slowly, 20, 30,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, you start to see some dental caries and bone disease showing up in the fossil record that wasn't there before. Hmm, something's headed in the wrong direction. And then that accelerates and accelerates. And we get to the point where at the start of the 1900s, cancer and heart disease and diabetes aren't in the top 10 killers of the people in America. And by now, they basically occupy the top three positions or the top four positions. Like it's everything has changed. And so the answer about the perfect human diet is to recognize that every species on earth has an evolved diet. And what that means is evolved nutritional dependencies and evolved capacity for extraction. And the more you veer away from that, the more likely you are to suffer with disease and consequence. And the closer you adhere to that evolved diet, the more likely it is that you are that you remain healthy and heal and recover when you're not. I think that is the perfect lead in to where I wanted to go next, which is the emotional and behavioral aspects of why we eat. And I've heard you talk before about that there are six primary reasons why people eat and understanding these reasons gives you greater control over your eating habits. Can you walk us through some of these reasons and explain why recognize them, recognizing them could help listeners make more conscious, intentional choices about their food choices? It's a tough topic to do quickly. It's a masterclass by itself, and it's a huge understanding of food psychology. And if people can grasp these things, they help a great deal. We call them the six hungers. And the general idea is that there are six primary hungers that drive all of your eating decisions. And it's not typical that any one of them motivates a particular eating decision heavily on its own, but collectively they gang up on you. And Out of the six hungers, only one of them actually relates to nutrition, and we would call that nutritional hunger. And nutritional hunger is a very important thing to understand because, first of all, how does it happen? Well, it happens when you're malnourished. And the vast majority of people in the developed world today are overeating stimulants and garbage and sugar and what have you, overeating calories, and then undereating nutrients. So they're literally overeating and starving to death at the same time, which means that their nutritional hunger is almost always activated. They're almost always nutritionally hungry. In fact, they often only stop eating because their stomach is so full that they're hurting, right? They, they want to keep eating. So that nutritional hunger is a very important piece. And of course, the best way to neutralize nutritional hunger is to eat really well, to focus on getting the good stuff in, and then you neutralize that hunger. The other trouble with nutritional hunger is that it's nonspecific. It's not like it says, oh, go get this because you need that. It basically says, eat what's available around you because we didn't have choice before. Mother nature controlled the availability of food. So you couldn't, if you were, for example, not in fruit season, there was no point in having a craving for fruit. It just wasn't there. So instead your body goes hungry, go eat something. Maybe it might direct you in the direction of a macro, like fat, salt, sweet, and what have you. But generally speaking, nutritional hunger is this general desire for food and the only genuine hunger. The other five are really fascinating. Thirst. Now people often, what do you mean thirst is a hunger? Well, I mean, I guess you could say thirst is a hunger for water, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is that for the vast majority of history, humans didn't have water bottles. (laughs) We didn't have running water. Like the water that we got was largely delivered to us from the food that we ate the fruits, the vegetables, the root vegetables, and even the meat that we ate was so fresh that it was heavy in water content. So we ate a lot of our water. Sure, we drank it when we could, but we didn't have the mechanism for carrying it around. So we got a lot of our, in fact, as an example of this, there's an antelope, at least one that I know of in Africa that never drinks. 
it doesn't go near the water. That's a great evolved response. You know why? Because there's freaking crocodiles in the water and the lions like to hunt there. So they evolved the ability to avoid going to the water. Where do they get their water from? They get their water from the plants they eat. So we also have a capacity to do that. The challenge today creates this problem. A lot of the food that we eat today is not water rich. So when you eat it, not only does it not replenish your hydration, but it actually utilizes some of the water you already had in you. So now somebody's dehydrated a little bit. They send up a craving and that is go eat something. We need water. Then they go eat a bag of Hostess potato chips, which has arguably a, a negative quantity of water in it because it uses water out of your body. You eat that and then you want more. Why do you want more? Because you need water. So you eat more. Now you want more. Why do you want that? Because you need, and the cycle is repeated. So that's a very powerful hunger. It drives a huge amount of our eating decisions. And one of the best ways to neutralize that is to prehydrate. If you are drinking to address your thirst, it's too late. I'll be more brief with the next four because frankly, I could get very carried away. But the next one is, let's say, empty stomach hunger. The idea that your stomach being hungry has anything to do, or sorry, the idea that your stomach being empty has anything to do with you being hungry. It doesn't. Your stomach being empty is actually a very important thing to do from time, to let it repair, to let it cleanse, to let it flush out, and to generally have more energy for healing and what have you. So that's why you see this big trend around intermittent fasting and fasting, because it actually is important to have empty stomach time. Most people have a Pavlovian link up between nutritional hunger and their stomach being empty. And they're like, oh, my stomach's empty. My stomach is growling. Yeah, it's cleansing. Leave it alone. So getting used to the feeling of an empty stomach is one of the biggest life upgrades that people can get. And that can be done with various forms of fasting. Low blood sugar hunger. It's not a form of hunger, but it feels like one. I, for the first time recently, wore a constant glucose monitor, and I found that to be a fascinating exercise. I even experimented a little outside of my normal regime so I could see what the impact that was. And I'll tell you, it's not the spike that you're trying to avoid. It's the crash after the spike. And most people are living with sugar spikes and crashes on a regular basis, and then they experience these low blood sugar moments. And during those low blood sugar moments, there are problems, emotional problems. That's when you snap at people. That's when you're angry. That's when you're grumpy. That's when you're fungry. <laughs> but the other problem is that it, it causes cravings. It, it causes you to have emergency cravings. And that's a problem because if you suddenly feel this emergency feeling, you're pretty much willing to eat anything. And next thing you're scarfing down a chocolate bar in the car on the way to pick up the kids, not ideal. And then the next one is variety. And the thing with variety is that we crave variety. And largely, I think this was a protection against eating any one thing for too long because plants in particular have defense mechanisms that are bad for us. So eating kale. I mean, if you talk to Dave Asprey, kale is killing the planet. And what I would argue is that while the current form of kale may well be doing that, that every plant is trying to defend itself. And our ancestors never were really hurt too much by those defenses because they evolved responses to them, except that they ate the plant seasonally. So they would eat the plant for as long as they could to get the benefit from it, but not longer so as that the toxins or, or anti-nutrients or anti-digestion uh, mechanisms were impacted. So they had a, 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 also a, a craving for variety. I, we've been eating this plant for a long time. Don't you think we should try to find something else? Only today, we want variety on a daily... No, we don't want variety on a daily basis. We want variety on our plate. I, I don't... Like you can have your friends going, oh, should we get sushi? Oh, I had sushi on Tuesday. I don't think I could do it again. I mean, our need for variety has driven insanity when there was a reason for it, but of course it's maldeployed. And then lastly, and I told you this would take a minute, the sixth hunger in this case would be emotion, emotional hunger. And this is where people have been conditioned uh, a variety of different ways. Some were unconscious parenting mistakes. Others were deeply manipulative advertising campaigns by unscrupulous food companies. But we have been sold the idea that this food can solve this emotional problem. And that is incredibly dangerous to us. Now, the real challenge is that, as I said, not any one of these hungers is a problem unto itself, but it's when they get combined. So you imagine somebody who's nutri nutritionally hungry, which is most people in America or Europe, for that matter, they're nutritionally hungry. And then let's say they have a blood sugar crash. And at the same point in time, they have a negative emotional response to what's going on in their life at that point. Those three hungers are going to end up with a bowl of ice cream, a bar of chocolate or a glass of wine or a pizza or whatever it is. And so neutralizing those hungers is one of the most valuable things you can do in facilitating long-term dietary change for people.
I'm glad you ended on emotional eating because following our conversation, I also had Dr. Judd Brewer, who you probably know on the show, and we explored his book, The Hunger Habit. And when I think about these six different reasons that you give for why we eat, all of them in some way or another tie into our behaviors, the habits that we become accustomed to. Can you explore that a little bit more of what our habits have to do with why we eat and how we go about eating? Sure, John. This is a little playful, but I basically want to suggest to you that all humans have this little app mm. that, that's running. We run apps. We run different apps. And we've got this one app. And the app basically says, if I am alive today, then whatever I did yesterday was good. Because for the majority of human history, survival was not a given. I mean, it was hard out there. I mean, it was hard 200 years ago, never mind 20,000 years ago. I mean, I have done embedded stays with Hadzabe people. And I can tell you at the end of a week, I am like, I cannot imagine living a year like this. It's a very hard lifestyle and you're facing survival issues on a regular basis. So if you woke up one day, then the app goes, wow, we made it. Yes. <laughs> Whatever we did yesterday is a good thing. And that app is the app that stimulates the creation of habits. So I, I think maybe you've probably seen Atomic Habits, great book, fascinating. And you have a lot of people talking about habits and there's this big debate. Does it take seven days or 21 days or 65 days to create a habit and all this kind of stuff, right? I would say to you that the, the premise of the question is flawed in the first place. It is not about the number of days. Yes, it looks like it is, and, and everybody believes that it is, but I would put to you that it's a combination of emo emotional intensity and repetition. So if you have 65 days of doing something, but you have no emotional response to it, sorry, it's not going to become a habit. I just don't think so. But if you do something one time with enough emotional intensity, it will become a habit. A good example is rookie sports guy playing, playing in the World Series baseball. The bases are, are loaded. There are two runs down. It's the bottom of the ninth. It's, everything's all positioned. And the kid slams a grand slam, wins the game. The crowd goes wild. The people are celebrating. Everything's amazing. He's producing incredible celebratory, celebratory chemicals in his body. Everything's amazing. And his body activates the app. Holy shit, this day was amazing. Not only did I survive, but look at all this attention. It's amazing. What did I do for the last 24 hours to create this magic? And so whatever he ate that day is going to become his game day food. And when he suddenly realizes that when he was tying his shoes, he banged his head on the locker. And it hurt. Not, he didn't get any blood, but it hurt. I guarantee you that kid's banging his head on the locker before every game for the rest of his life. It's <laughs> not about the number of days for repetition. It's about the level of emotional intensity. And so when you understand that about habit creation, now we take a look at a kid who just slipped and fell down. Now, John, I, I know you've seen it. Kid falls down, looks up. No parent looking, kid gets up and keeps playing. If it wasn't too bad, right? But if the dad's looking, the kid's got one response. If mom was looking, the kid's got another response, right? Like it's, it's a moment, right? And, 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 and what's gonna happen in that moment? There's pain, I fell, there's surprise. And I suddenly see the most nurturing person around and I start to cry. And that person wants to end my pain. And they come along and give me a cookie. And in that moment, just like the kid with the baseball game, I have learned that cookie is a combination, an unbelievable combination. It is a combination of anesthetic and a communication of love. And so that's why at 45 years old, I'm scarfing down a cookie when I feel bad. Well, I love that explanation. And it leads me into so many people realize that health is important. And I love something that Rory Vaden has told me for those who know Rory is that people don't pay for knowledge. They pay for the application of knowledge. And there's so much knowledge out there about you need to improve your health. Yet I find that it's so difficult for people to translate what they know and what they hear into lasting behavior change. Yeah. For someone who's listening today, what's the first step that you recommend that they can take to truly get their body and mind back on track? Um, it's a tough question because it has a lot to do with their starting point and how much pain they're in and what their primary motivations are and so on. But I'll start with this. 
uh, the diet, the fad diet industry, the weight loss industry, the biohack industry, the longevity sciences industry, this whole influencer field that we're in at the moment, unfortunately, is influenced by algorithm. And so what that means is that we know that controversy and that kind of stuff feeds the algorithm. And so therefore, we have to do stuff like that. And so one of the things that we see a lot is fear based campaigning, avoid these seven dangerous foods, like I, I could do a series of videos that would first of all frighten people about eating meat then i could do another video that would frighten people about not eating meat and then i could do a video that would frighten people about eating kale and then i could do a video that would frighten people about drinking too much water and then i could do a video about about frightening people about the sun as if that's not already been done to them i could frighten you about just about everything and then you're like what, what's left what the hell do i do but the challenge is that because we are very easily motivated by fear it's a great way to get people's attention and so most diets and life hack programs of some kind are predicated upon making you feel fearful and telling you to give up stuff. And often they're telling you to give up stuff that's deep in your heart and you have a deep connection with. And they're trying to do that at the same time while you're probably somewhat malnourished if you're an average person living in the developed world. So this is one of the many reasons that diets simply fail. And I will be really clear about when I say that diets do fail. People don't fail. Diets fail people. The diets are badly constructed psychologically and mostly nutritionally, and they fail people constantly. And, and, and it's awful because it's, it's the, the industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. And the reason that it's a multi-billion dollar industry is because it doesn't work. If it worked, you wouldn't need billions and billions of books about it. So I want to suggest that we break with some of those trends. And if, if it has to be down to one thing to focus on, this would be the one thing to focus on. Don't focus on removing everything you love. Focus on eating the stuff that your body needs. Start there. Okay, you want to eat ice cream? Do that. But, but eat the good stuff first. You want to have a chocolate bar? Go for it. I mean, I would say choose better quality chocolate if you can. That's okay with you. But first of all, make sure you're getting your core needs met. We know categorically, without debate, without cognitive dissonance, without any question that humans have spent the last 300,000 years as sapiens and arguably another five or six million years as pre-sapiens, we know that our diet is largely comprised and, and, and really made up of seasonally available meats, fish, poultry, eggs, seasonally available fruits, vegetables, and root vegetables, and seasonally available nuts and seeds. So I would suggest that if you were to build your focus on getting enough of those natural things in, that would be the best starting place. I think that's great advice. And I think everything that you do with your wild fit program, and maybe you can introduce that uh, for the, the listeners so they know what it is. Behavioral change is at the core of the success. And what I find is most of these diets rely on willpower and fail long term. How have you been able to integrate behavioral psychology to ensure that people make lasting changes? I would say there's a few different points to touch on there. First of all, let's talk a little bit about willpower. Willpower is a largely misunderstood thing. It's a bit like a muscle. And what happens is that it's a muscle that's designed for um, short-term tension. So you and I, for example, could go to the Maldives and go free diving. And in order to go free diving, we would need to use willpower to hold our breath. We would use will to not breathe while we're under the water. But if you were underwater and you got stuck under there, then eventually your willpower would give out and you would try to breathe even though you were underwater, right? So willpower is this short-term thing that can only hold on for so long, even when it should keep holding on, it won't. And I would suggest is exactly what most people experience on a willpower-based diet. They hold their breath, they stick with it as long as they can, and then any number of things interrupt them and get in their way. Uh, in fact, I read a big, I read about a big study wherein it said adults go on an average of two diets a year through their lifetime and stick to each one for only seven days. There's your willpower window for food for most people. Some are better, some are worse, but there's the average. So that's the first thing to look at. The second thing to look at is to look at the structure of the programs they're on. And generally speaking, if I were in 
teenage alien from another planet here to evaluate the diet industry, I would have to deduce, I mean, looking at the output, I would have to deduce that the entire diet industry positions itself about helping people lose weight. And meanwhile, seems to be constructed with the specific intent of damaging people's self-esteem <laughs> and destroying their relationship with their body. Like oh, you should restrict all your favorite foods immediately. You should go on deep calorie restriction to lose weight. You should exercise your ass off, even though you're overweight and you're going to damage your knees doing so. I mean, it's lie after myth after lie after myth. And so that's the first, that's the next step is to really evaluate those things and part with them, let them go, let go of the diet mentality. And then we get into the things that we do with our clients and we really do a deep dive into their food psychology, understanding how they created their beliefs about food, their habits about food and so on. And I could do, again, we could do a whole masterclass on that discussion, but I'll give you one really tangible example. Um, if you eat something very calorie rich, your body will reward you for that. It'll taste good. It'll feel good. You'll produce feel good neurotransmitters. Like it'll reward you for that. And that reward is designed to act as an indexing feature. Memories are created by emotional response. So th that emotional response is like an indexing feature of, oh, this was a good decision I made. Well done. And what led up to this decision? Let's repeat that behavior. And that's a deep human mechanism. Now take somebody who's had say a crappy day at work and then they get in the car and they have some road rage and then suddenly they feel inspired to stop off at Krispy Kreme, Dunkin' Donuts, Tim Hortons or any number of other diabetes peddling organizations and they get there and they're suddenly eating a donut to help them feel better. They eat the donut, they get the coffee, the caffeine and the sugar and all the stimulant and their body goes, oh, well done, because the body doesn't know about bad stuff. It doesn't understand that. It's brand new to humans. The body goes, well done. And then it says, whatever did we do to leave to this magic reward? Oh, road rage. That's what we did. And so pretty soon your body begins to learn that if it wants those big payoff, cheap garbage calories, all it has to do is trigger you to have a road rage incident or to have a bad day at work. So when you use food as a, an anesthetic for say a negative emotional con, uh, uh, state, what you're doing is teaching your body that the path to that food is through that emotional state. So the body goes, well, I'm feeling like an ice cream. I know how to do that. Bring on depression. And the next thing you know, you're having an ice cream. On the other hand, if you refuse to do that and you only reward success, you only reward your best possible days. You only reward the completion of big projects. You only reward you showing up in the best possible way. That's the day that you have the ice cream. I, I would argue against ice cream as a regular food anyway, but if you're going to have it as a reward mechanism and then your body goes, wow, the path to ice cream is by finishing the book I've been writing or completing that big project or work, or wow, my kids pushed my buttons today and I rocked it. I didn't raise my voice. I was loving. I was compassionate. I understood that I'm the parent in the situation. Now I can have an ice cream. And so you get to employ a really powerful principle in the wildfit community in that, or geez, I think it's just basically a human principle, but that is any behavior that you reward is very likely to be repeated. So do you want to reward your road rage? Do you want to reward your sadness and depression? Do you want to reward those feelings of loneliness? I don't think so. Well, I love how you just explored behavioral triggers and really what you were just saying is that those triggers around food are tied to social situations, stress, our environment, things that are going on. And we keep tending to reward ourselves oftentimes for things that we're not holding ourselves accountable for. Yeah. Which leads me to how much does accountability play in creating the lasting change that we want? Well, proper accountability plays every role. It's unbelievably important, but the wrong kind of accountability is a problem. And, and let me explain what I mean. The diet industry has been just destroying people's psychology and self-esteem for many decades at this point. And the idea there is that, oh, you gave in. Oh, you slipped up. Oh, you cheated, right? Like if you look at that whole diet mentality thing, then the idea is to trigger a sense of shame in people. Now I want to be really clear. I think shame is one of the best emotions ever because it's a huge behavior modifier. It can work really well, but it only works really well when you handle it really well. And when somebody else didn't give it to you, what I mean is that your own internal shame has the ability to really help you improve and become a better human being. But when a company is making you feel shameful about failing at their product, that's something else. That's something else that's going on. So 
when we talk about accountability, if the accountability is functional, that is to say, I'm taking responsibility, then that is going to be a big component of the transformation. But if the accountability is, I feel shameful, which is another form of accountability, then shame, unfortunately, is a negative emotion that also acts as a food trigger and a self-esteem destruction. So the next thing you know, that form of accountability can be a problem. And I would say that a lot of the eating disorders that we see are an over application of accountability. When you see somebody walking into a toilet, sticking their fingers down their throat and vomiting up their meal, that's accountability, but not the right kind. And one more question about your program. WildFit boasts 80 to 90% success rates, which is unheard of in the diet industry or in the health industry as a whole. Why do you think your approach is so different and has such higher levels of sustained behavioral change in your participants? I would say there's a few components. And the first one is consumption of the program. That's a very important thing. If you buy a diet book or a diet program or a health program and you don't read it or you don't watch it or you don't consume it, it's probably not gonna work. <laughs> that's, that's a, we could start there. And when I first decided to do this, I was approached by many people that were saying, hey, you should do a book about this. And I was like, I don't know. I don't think a book is the right venue. Like, I want to use multimedia. I want to be able to convey more emotion and I want to do it digitally. And, and so I created it as a digital program. But before I did that, I did a bunch of research into digital education programs. And what I found out was shocking. And that is that the average industry completion rate of digital programs is something like six or 7%, which is really shocking since most of these programs are like five or six modules long and you can watch them in a day. It's like, why are people not completing them? In fact, one story that just broke my heart, but really opened my eyes was that there were these internet marketers talking about this 10 DVD back in the days of DVDs, but 10 DVD, how to make a million dollars or whatever it was program they had. And after years of selling it and making millions of dollars selling it, they got a note at the help desk and it was like, oh, my 10th DVD was blank. And they're like, oh, no problem. We'll just send you another one. So they grabbed a 10th DVD, stuck it in the player to make sure it was good, just because you want to check. And it was blank. And like, That's weird. What a coincidence. Well, further investigation led them to find out that they had never printed the 10th DVD. And that made them laugh their asses off because it meant for years and years, people have been buying this program and never getting to the 10th DVD. That would not make me laugh. That would make me feel like an abject failure. If I created a program and you don't watch the 10th DVD, I have let you down. And so I constructed a mechanism of developing transformative education programs called behavioral change dynamics. And there's a number of principles and filters and mechanisms for how you deliver content to people so that it's sticky. So I can tell you like the first metric in helping people transform is getting them to actually engage. So the first metric we, we were really working on, we achieved an 85 to 90% completion rate for people who started the program to completing it. And that wasn't measured by us. That was measured by our publisher. That was told to us as an external number. That was pretty cool. So then the next part of it is the transformative technique or the transformative structure of the program. And the program is an incredible balance of really solid nutritional principles informed by evolutionary biology and really powerful step-by-step -step incremental psychological shifts that people make so that they won't have to rely on willpower or that they will learn how to use willpower in very short bursts to achieve what they want over the long term because they've changed their identity. And that's really the big deal is that people come out of the end of it and they're like, I am a different person. And, and I, I'll put it in one simple term. If you want to eat ice cream, you're going to eat it. You're going to. I, I, maybe not a lot, maybe a lot. You can use willpower from time to time, but you're gonna, if you want it, it you're going to eat it. What if we could get you to not want it, or we could reduce your wants sufficiently that it really truly was an annual event rather than a weekly one? Well, I think that's a great way to think about the whole thing. And personally, I had my challenges with wanting to eat ice cream because it's probably my favorite dessert, but you're right. When you get in that mindset, that you don't crave it, you don't need it, and it becomes something that you put to the side, you'd consume a lot less of it for sure. John, at the risk of coaching without permission, well, let me put it in a, can I offer sure. you that? Sure, yeah, okay. absolutely. Here's my little prescription for you. Continue to eat ice cream, but do what I said earlier. From now on, for say three months, only eat ice cream on exceptionally amazing days. Only eat ice cream when you have shown up in business the way you want, as a father the way you want, when your emotions are tuned in, it's those days where you go, wow, I was amazing today. 
only eat ice cream on those days and never eat ice cream on a bad day, on a day that didn't go well. So you start there. And then what I think you'll find is that on some of those truly amazing days, you won't even want it. And that's interesting in and of itself. So that's step one. And then step two would be, you know what? Don't even worry about step two. One day I'll get you, you come in and do the whole wildfit program. I'll take you through steps three and 93, but start with that step one. I'll bet you, you change your whole relationship with ice cream just by making that one change. I think that's a great leave behind for anyone who's here is it's got to start with that first step and then go from there before you're going to be able to perfect any of the other ones. Eric, if people wanted to understand more about you, where's the best place for them to go to learn about your programs, your writing, and the work that you're doing? Sure. For WildFit, go to getwildfit.com. In fact, I think we have a two-week trial there where people can go and do that super easily. Low touch just gives them a sample of what's going on. And I think that they'll find that pretty mind-blowing. And generally, you can find me at eric.ee, www.eric.ee. And I'm active on Instagram. I, I manage my own Instagram account. And I very often reply to people directly when they've got questions and stuff like that. And I'm happy to support people. My main areas to that, that where I really love supporting people is in helping them find their passion from an entrepreneurial perspective, helping them become really effective at communicating. And first of all, and of highest priority is helping them really come to grips with mastering their own health and quality of life and expanding their health span. And if I can help people, I will. Well, Eric, thank you so much for coming back on the program. It's always such a, an incredible honor to have you on Passion Struck. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. Good to see you.